Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Biopharma Podcast. I am so excited today. As you can tell, this doesn't look normal. I'm not on a Zoom <laughs> screen, and neither are these guys. We are at the Mettler Toledo facility here in Bill Ricca. Is that right? Yes. Bill Ricca, Bill Ricca, Massachusetts, and they have their own e-studio. So all around us, you can't see them behind the cameras, but there's big lights and there's green screens. It's super exciting. And so we're here to talk about uh, new technology that Mettler's been putting out there into the pharmaceutical space, in the water uh, space specifically today. And I got two special guests with me today. So with me, I have Peggy Bannerhall and Tracy Radcliffe. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so I, because I'm at your space, you're not at mine, so it's a little different. <laughs> but if you could, just for everybody listening, they don't know who you are, could you just give a, just a quick intro of who you are, what you do, and, and how you work with this machine? Yeah, sure. So my name is Peggy Bannerhall, as Jesse um, spoke, and I'm one of the product managers here at the Metler Toledo Process Analytics Division. And uh, my background is I started out in clinical micro microbiology, where I was the person that was identifying organisms in, my, in uh, human specimens. So, and then I uh, went on to industrial um, microbiology. So, I've been in the pharmaceutical industry, semiconductor industry. I've been at Mettler Toledo for about 14 years, and I'm happy to be here. All right. Thanks, Peggy. Tracy. Hi, guys. I'm Tracy Radcliffe, and I am the microbial detection specialist here at Mettler Toledo, and uh, microbial detection is my life, basically. <laughs> and uh, I've been in uh, microbiology for a really long time. I started my career in vaccine research, and uh, fast forward, uh, ended up in uh, various industries, uh, food and beverage, environmental microbiology, oil and gas. Uh, microbiology and finally back to pharma. So I've been in rapid microbial diagnostics for about 13 years now. So I have a varied role here that is both technical and business development oriented and uh, that appeals to my right brain and my left brain. So I'm pretty happy to be here as well and uh, we hope we teach you something today. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. All right. So before we get going into sort of the meat of what we want to talk about today, first, um, in the farm industry, maybe this isn't the case. In the general population, somebody sees the name Mettler Toledo. They may not think of microbiology, right? They've probably seen it on scales, maybe at, at different places they might go. But even in the pharma space, I think, you know, people are used to seeing scales. That's what I think historically you guys are known for. So yeah. so talk about this because this doesn't look like a scale. And we're talking about water. Well, it could look like a scale, <laughs> but it's not a scale. You're right. Uh, when, when you hear Mettler Toledo, that is what you think about. That's a great reputation, a great history of Mettler Toledo and scales, yep. both analytical and industrial scales. But our division, um, he, this instrument is actually part of the process analytics division. And we have two divisions. One is uh, Thornton, where the instrument here is made by Thornton here in Bill Ricca. And we specialize in uh, water analytics. And so specifically pure water analytics, such as water for injection, purified water. And we're known for our conductivity sensors, conductivity and resistivity. The company's been around, um, started in the resistivity area in semiconductor in the, in the 60s, and we branched out into pharma um, several years later. And so we have TOC analyzers in addition. Uh, and so the microbial analyzer um, fit really nicely mm -hmm. with uh, the water analytics side because, as you know, in regulated, or regulated water systems, the compendial measurements are microbial, TOC, conductivity, and if you are ozonating, um, you know, ozone. Mm. All right, yeah, so that's, the next, that's actually the next question we're going to talk to you. So when we think of pharma water, um, we, we think of a few different critical parameters, right? We, we talk about conductivity. You guys are well known for that. We talk about, um, I, got, I got my things down here, but with the conductivity is the big one that people always think of when they think about WIFI. They think about TOC. Again, you guys are very well known for that. 
Um, what's the need for the BioBird and Analyzer? Right now, everybody pretty much does the testing for BioBird and offline. They take it, test it in a plate, and like, I, I just, just I'm gonna just play dumb here and just say, well, I mean, if BioBird is off, wouldn't TOC and conductivity probably be off? Are you really catching anything, you know, with a real time um, microbial test? So what's what's the goal there? What are we trying to accomplish? So you know, you that it's a really great question. Um, Conductivity, resistivity, of course, tells you, do I have any inorganic contamination mm -hmm. in my water, yeah. which is regulated. TOC, total organic carbon, that covers the organic contamination. Mm -hmm. um, but the organic contamination can be due to biofilm, but it also can be due to alcohols or any mm -hmm. other component that passes through a... Um, a um, water system purification component. Yep. And so you always want to make sure that you don't have organic material that causes biofilms to proliferate. Right. But it's very specifically stated in the test chapter for TOC is that you can't really use TOC as an indication of uh, biofilm mm -hmm. or microbial contamination or endotoxin contamination. They're very different entities. And today, as you mentioned, we do uh, plate counts as a way of assessing our water systems um, for microbial contamination. It's a very old test, tried and true test, but it's not that good. Mm -hmm. And even the United States Pharmacopeia sa says that there could be microbial presence in your water system, and less than 1% of the time will you see it growing on plates. And so why is that? These organisms are stressed, right? Yeah. They're stressed in an in a ultra-pure water environment. And so it matters that we can't detect them on plates. Do we hold the plates long enough? Are we at the right temperature? Does mm -hmm. the organism even want to grow on a plate? Mm -hmm. And so hence these online analyzers present a uh, real opportunity for now to, for us to see the microbial yeah. environment where we couldn't necessarily before. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when you talk about, so obviously biological growth is organic in nature, yes. right? So, and we have a limit of 500 ppb, right, in our, in our water systems for TOC. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to get to an unhealthy level of bio burden, how does that, if, if you were to put a TOC number, is there a TOC number to that? And how, how high up on that scale would it go? Well, that's a really great like question. I would love to have that answer, <laughs> but um, but no, you it, just because you have a high TOC number doesn't mean you are going to have a biofilm problem. Um, it could become a biofilm problem, right. um, but the biofilm problem will remain if your TOC uh, is uh, you know is present and it's not 500 ppb. Mm -hmm. And so enough. I want to read you this. Um, I, uh, I saved this, actually. So this is from 643, which is the test chapter for um, TOC. And, and they state, a TOC measurement is not a replacement test for endotoxin or microbial control. Although there can be qualitative relationship between a food source, which is TOC, and microbial activity, there is no direct numerical correlation. Hmm. All right. Is, so, so when we think about this... Um, seeing um, uh, like microbiology, right? To, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more. Do, does it also detect, would endotoxin be in that same realm or is it separate? Is it a different thing that it's looking at? Would endotoxin be sort of bulked in with sort of live bacteria? I'm just curious how that works. Well, endotoxin is a component of the cell the, right, membrane. Right. So, it's, so it is evidence. If you have, and, and, uh, and I think that you've run into this, where mm -hmm. a customer will say, oh yeah, we don't have a problem with it with uh, um, microbial contamination. Mm -hmm. Do you have a problem with endotoxin? And they'll say, yeah, we do. <laughs> okay, if you have endotoxin, <laughs> then you also have bugs, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, so they are related, um, but you really need to do both mm -hmm. because yeah. we only require endotoxin for water for injection, right? Mm -hmm. right? right. What Not about purified, purified water, yeah. right? And that's, yeah. a that's a compendial test, right. Right. the LAL endo endotoxin test. Now, right. yeah. Granted, in pure water, you're likely going to have gram-negative organisms, so mm -hmm. it could potentially tell you that endotoxins could be there. 
but it's not going to say yes, it's positive for endotoxin. We can't say that. From I just didn't know if like the what it's seeing, you know, we haven't gotten there, but what is it seeing? Would it also be picking up on the endotoxin? Indecipherable between the two, I guess, mm -hmm. is kind of what I meant. Would they look yeah. the same? So I guess not. We're not there yet, but that's on no, it No, <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, I, I've seen stuff out there for endotoxin, so I was just curious. Yeah. So, so as we look at this, um, you know, being an online instrument, um, you know, if, if you were to, to, to go out in the future a little bit, you know, we think about water systems with conductivity or TOC. Um, we, we, I think we have a really good understanding of what causes things to go up and down in a water system with those two things, just because we get to watch them so real time. Do, do you think that maybe that might bring this to the world of water? Because because with a plate count, you're seeing what happened three to five days ago, right? I mean, so you're, you're, <laughs> you yeah. have no idea, right? And then you have to go back and figure out what was the hiccup. So with this, with it being real time, are you thinking that that actually, while this is, is seeing these spikes, right? This is gonna see spikes. In the end, the more we do this, the better we get at understanding things actually will start to level things out. Do you, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I th Sorry, I, th I talked too long there. No, okay. <laughs> no I mean, that, um, that's a really good point, and that really just brings you to the point of, the, of why do it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. we have this plate count that we've done forever. Why do this? Well, we, also, we know that biofilms exist in water systems. They do. Organisms survive. They're right. everywhere. Mm -hmm. They wall themselves off in their biofilm, and um, when they proliferate, maybe they grow on the plate. But we also know with this instrument, because we're able to de de detect these microbial cells continuously, we know that water system dynamics can shift what occurs with the normal biofilm environment mm -hmm. in a water system. And, and with these instruments, we can see that change. So now right. you actually could be proactive. Mm -hmm. um, you could be proactive in your approach to, okay, I did maintenance here, or I did, or someone um, used another tank and, uh, and pump, mm -hmm. uh, drew water off in a different location. Well, there, there may have been a shift in the microbial environment, and sometimes it can be significant. Yeah. Sometimes it can't, but the point is now, we would never see it. Right, mm -hmm. right. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I think... The more customers that we've worked with on this, the more interesting trends we're seeing and uh, identifiable root causes of mm -hmm. contamination. And there's been some really interesting case studies, not only what Peggy's talking about with water system dynamics, because you know, any anytime you do maintenance or any type of intervention, um, you know, switching tanks and pumps is a big one. If people are switching from a primary loop to a secondary loop and maybe the loop hasn't been used in a long time mm -hmm. there could be biofilm in there and then there's also been uh, trends identified with source water where some customers that uh, maybe they have lake water or reservoir water yeah, yeah. as a water source they can see seasonal uh, upward shifts in their autofluorescent unit counts Oh. So that's been a really interesting thing to see as well. I, and I you're was, seeing it all I in real time. I was curious about that. I mean, because we, I, I work in water, so I know that the seasonal variation causes yeah. all kinds of different, not just in bacteria and lots of things. Yeah, and we're seeing, we're seeing more and more evidence of that. And so um, one customer that we worked with recently, uh, they may be able to fine tune their sanitization process when their counts are higher in the summer months from right. their source water. Huh. So again, like Peggy said, there are a lot of things that you can find out about your water system that you would have zero visibility in if you were only relying on plate counts. Right, right. So, okay, so we're gonna, I just wanna jump into another little subject here and then I think we're gonna talk more about the process itself and sort of what you guys are doing. But so in a former life, not my current role, not my, few roles ago, I used to do uh, water testing I, out at customer sites, but not in the pharma, more in an industrial space, so cooling towers. And the company I was with at the time was really pushing something called ATP testing, which, um, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a biology guy. I don't really know what it was. I just knew what I was supposed <laughs> to do. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and historically, people used a, a version of the plate count, not the same, but mm -hmm. similar to what we do in pharma. And when we would go into a new customer and say, hey, this is what we do, this is how we 
maintain control and look for problems. They'd be like, well, about what, what is that? And we're like, trust us. Yeah. <laughs> it, it works, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's this relative thing. We're like, we're, we're going to watch this number. It's way faster test. It's like, mm -hmm. boom, it's a minute long test is basically how that one was. And we, we can know if it's been moving up, down, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have to have a, a place to keep the thing warm for three days. We didn't mm -hmm. have to come back in three days to check it. Right. So all these, there's a lot of variables that just went away in that mm -hmm. testing. I found it to be much more reliable from a process control perspective because I was able to adjust immediately based on a one minute test in th three to five days. And what I was doing, huge mm -hmm. issues could happen in three to five days. And there was nothing really slowing it down in mm -hmm. the meantime. So, right. but, but, but to that end, the biggest problem that I saw was just getting people to, like, on board to understand, to be like, yeah, but how many CFU? Right. That's all they cared about, <laughs> right? That. Because that's what they've been looking at <laughs> yeah. for 40 years in this yeah. environment. And be like, it doesn't matter. Now, yeah. now that's a little different in this industry because it does matter in there right. because yes, that's just does. the rules now, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. maybe that will change over time. But right now that's the rules. Mm -hmm. In theirs, it didn't matter. It was it was just yeah. an indication. That's all it was, and adjust things. So it's a shift talk, in mindset. Talk to that. What we're dealing oh, with in pharma and what you guys are dealing with. How do you talk to that with a customer? Well, I have all sorts of things to say about ATP, I'm sure you first do. of all. <laughs> So um, interestingly enough, along with what you were saying about, you know, opposition that you might have faced in trying to introduce ATP as a new technology, I had a similar situation probably about 10 years ago now introducing it to petroleum microbiologists mm -hmm. because, you know, like we're talking about plate counts, the standard for mi microbiologically influenced corrosion in oil field microbiology was a 30-day serial oh. dilution test Yikes. and that was the NACE wow, standard. That's incredible. Well, introduce ATP and again, they're like, what is this? Is it live versus dead? You know, and, and all, all of the same questions that, that we get with the RMS and of course, you know, I'm a big Monty Python fan. I like to say, well, it's not dead yet. <laughs> it's getting better. <laughs> um, <laughs> so This could go off the rails quick. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> So anyway, it's um, you know, very much the same paradigm shift in terms of pharma micro, where you're talking about you know, hundred year old method being the standard and introducing a rapid test. Mm -hmm. And one thing that Peggy frequently says that I I really like is that it's not so much the number as it is the trend. Mm -hmm. And what is the trend showing us? Are you having upward? You know, are your counts continuing to go upward? Mm -hmm. And for how long are those high counts sustained? Yeah. That indicates a problem. Okay. So, you know, this, this is very similar to ATP in that it would fall under, you know, a screening test. You're looking for presence or absence of bacteria. Yeah. I would say in terms of the RMS, you're, you're looking at laser-induced fluorescence. So it's definitely more sensitive than ATP because we're looking at uh, bacteria at the cellular level, mm -hmm. um, but sim very similar concept. Yeah. Okay. And and when you when you talk to people that might be looking at this as a as a as a thing to use at their facility, um, like what are the per this is off script? What are the <laughs> what are the personalities like in as far as how do you talk to different people? Because I imagine that mm. there's 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 change agents, right? I, I, I'm one of those guys. I want the new thing. Like, I think mm -hmm, it's fun. Absolutely. Right? And then there's then there's non, and it, it, it may be age-related. It may not be age-related. It may be type of role-related. Mm -hmm. how, how are you navigating that? Because it's, it's a big deal. You're, you're not just you're not just changing technology. You're, you're, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how are you navigating that? Well, you know, I think that, and also, Tracy, I'm sure you have things to say about that, too. It really depends on who you're talking to. There are people who are definitely change agents. They have read about the technology. They're excited about it. They, they want to give it a try, mm -hmm. and they want to get more information on their water system. And then, of course, you have the true microbiology and quality control folks who have a job to do, mm -hmm. and they're concerned about the answer. What is the answer? This is not the answer <laughs> that I thought I was going to get. Yeah. 
I, we understand that this is, and so sometimes you have to, you have to really be prepared for those questions and you have to talk to them about, yeah, that's, this is a different measurement unit. It's just a different screening methodology. Yeah. And I think when we start to explain to them that we're not competing with what you're doing, you have to do the compendial test because that's what the compendial uh, rules are. That's mm -hmm. what all of the pharmacopoeia require. Yeah. However, wouldn't it be nice if you knew before you had to shut your water system down that you had trouble brewing upstream? Wouldn't mm -hmm. it be a great thing? And that's how you can use it. And also, wouldn't it be nice if those plate counts, you didn't have to do as many? Yeah. You know, that if you, had, you were monitoring continuously on your water loop, would you re would, could there be non-critical samples that you now did not have to take right. because you have additional information? And that's where we get more people start to understand. Right. What do you think? You think that's true? I, I would agree. And, you know, to add on to everything Peggy said, it's a very complex process, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different stakeholders, uh, engineering, capital projects, uh, yeah. sometimes system fabricators, mm -hmm. and, and then QC, right? QC is the, I don't want to say overlord, but, you know, they, they have to give their blessing, right? Yeah. So they oftentimes... Do. They do have full veto power. Yeah. They have full, they full veto it's power. A great they really do. Party. That's what yeah. we've experienced, yeah. Yeah. right? Now, as a former QC microbiologist, I, I like to say I speak QC, and so uh, that, that helps to some extent, but you really have to ask a lot of questions and find out what is most important to them. Uh, you know, there's a couple different scenarios where people have really embraced the technology. Obviously, one would be if they had a contamination. Mm -hmm. And if they, if it was severe enough that it shut down their water system for, you know, a certain period of time and they were having trouble determining where the source of the biofilm was. Yep. You know, it's, it's very hard to, uh, and very time consuming to do an investigation like that on plate counts alone. Yeah. So that's one scenario. And then there's other scenarios like um, uh, brand new water systems. You know, people want to be able to assure that they're making the best quality of water possible from the very beginning. There's so many new uh, construction projects um, you know, new vaccine facilities, new cell and gene therapy facilities going up. Mm -hmm. They want to make sure that from day one, when they turn the water on, that it's good. And uh, so that's another benefit of having something real time. And um, Can you speak to that really quick? So like when you look at the different types of facilities that this is going in, you know, my first blush at this would always be like, anytime somebody's experienced a really bad issue, Right. Mm -hmm. At some point, the pain gets so much they're like, "Help!" Right, and they just give me something, and if this will help me figure it out, mm -hmm. fix it, so be it. Um, and those are those kind of situations are always going to be, you know, opportunities for change. Right, mm -hmm. but but new facilities, right? New facilities are new, and that's great. But it's usually the same people from a different facility that come into a new facility, right? And they all want to do, I did this at this, I've, I've done this for 20 years. I'm not mm -hmm. going to just change because I'm in a, you know, a new facility with fancy paint, right? Right. So what are the, are there certain kinds of facilities that are really looking at this and, and putting value on it? So when I think, I'm like, vaccine, you mentioned vaccine. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's kind of an oldie, right? They've been around a long time. They're traditional, historically, um, although with all the Myrna stuff now, maybe they're not, maybe they're, they have a whole new DNA to them, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. So how is that, how is that happening? What are you seeing facility adoption wise? Yeah, so uh, great question. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a couple different answers. So definitely contract manufacturers mm -hmm. uh, is one of the big areas. And if you, so the way I like to think about it, you know, the, the people that are most embracing this are the ones that are making products that have the highest risk to patients, mm. okay? And, and where water is a main ingredient. Okay. So if you think about what is the potential risk at a contract manufacturer, you know, let's just say 
you're you're a CMO and you have 16 suites. Mm -hmm. That could be either one customer renting out all 16 suites for production, or it could be 16 different customers. All using the same water, potentially. Correct. And yeah. so if you think right. about risk management, you know, their risk is almost higher than that of, you know, one pharma facility making one product, mm -hmm. right? Because you're talking about brand protection for everybody that they're making product for. Yeah. So that's definitely one aspect. Another interesting trend is cell and gene therapy. Mm -hmm. And part of that reasoning is, you know, the, uh, the manufacturing for cell and gene therapy products and the speed at which they have to be manufactured is critical, right? Because these patients need those therapies. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, uh, because in some cases, traditional microbiology testing does not meet the needs of the manufacturing process in that they can't afford to wait 14 days for traditional sterility mm. test yeah. or stability test. You know, the, the product has to be made and then uh, put into a patient. So we've uncovered this theme of people wanting to automate as much quality into their process analytics as possible. Okay. And that's really exciting to see. Okay. And how are they, how are they dividing out? So we, we still have to do play counts and we're adding this in. So mm -hmm. I have my own thoughts, but just you guys tell me, like, how are they breaking that out? Like who, who owns this versus a play count? Oh, that's a great facility. question. That <laughs> is a great question. Um, multiple and, answers. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'm hearing, Tracy um, and Jesse, that, that quality still owns it because hmm. if they have this instrument, nobody uh, kind of knows where it fits because yeah. it's a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. So sometimes the water system owner or the um, process engineer, that group owns it, but there's always the quality and micro piece because that's who they've always worked with. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like dual owners. And, mm -hmm. But sometimes I have heard that, you know, the quality person will call up and go, uh, you know, I um, don't understand this instrument. Uh, it was put on a water skid. I have it. I'm really, I'm excited about <laughs> it, but I'm not really sure what it does. And so, um, so we, it's really multiple fronts, um, okay. but we uh, and always... I, and I would expect that the kind of people that are going to even understand this, that not everybody's going to understand what's going on here, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, Sometimes they, the they product can watch the line, I guess, but... The product, product, project engineers or the product engineers are real, process engineers, I should say, they are really your friends sometimes okay. because they get it. They're the ones that are looking or getting control room information on their resistivity and TOC online results. Mm -hmm. It used to be 20 years ago where nobody had an online TOC device. Yep. And we were, you know, companies were trying to convince people, hey, online is the way to go. Yep. Yeah, I get it in my lab. I'm not sure I really need it. Now everybody has yep. it. And why do they have it? Because they know that they can reduce the risk by having it, even if they still use the laboratory measurement. Yeah. So go ahead. I think you had, you had comments or no? What she's, was the question again? She's, she's always got comments. I even thought. She's, I always have. She's three questions ahead of us. Don't, don't you worry about her. Um, so I just want to talk real quick. Um, we did touch on it briefly, but the idea of like, it's, this goes to this question is right now they have some kind of sampling regimen, right? At a facility. Um, all the different, you know, use points mm -hmm. at the generation, at distribution of the tank, all these different places where they have to sample. Everyone's going to have its own every day, every other day, whatever mm -hmm. it happens to be. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty significant undertaking and expense for a facility. So when you do something like this, where you now have a new measurement that doesn't correlate to any of those things, um, how does, how does that play out? Because from a process perspective, it makes sense that this will help you understand the control that you have on your bio burden, but the measurement currently doesn't have any real meaning in the, in the world of, yes, this is good wi -Fi. Right. So it could say all at once, but it didn't tell you that your CFUs were low or low enough or within, within range. So how do you break that out? How do you take away you know, one a week sampling or, or whatever it happens to be because you trust that. It's like a risk mitigation strategy, I guess, with your water system. Can you talk to what that looks like and 
how customers are saving? Sure, I have a couple of examples actually. So, um, and yes, people are doing a lot of plate counts, some unnecessary. I mean, and we, we work with facilities of all different sizes from mm-hmm. really small facilities that maybe they're only doing like, you know, a couple samples a week versus larger facilities that have 275 points of use and they're sampling every day yep. and they know that's way too much and not sustainable. But how do I stop? <laughs> that's all their microbiologists do, <laughs> I'm right? Yeah. So, um, so data collection, yeah. obviously, is a big component of that. Uh, in the case of one customer who uh, went through a full validation of the system and uh, actually dropped their plate counts by 70 percent. Whoa. Yeah. That's a uh, lot. And it was a big deal for them because they were sending all of their microbiology samples out to a third party, and which probably cost three times what you would pay in-house per plate count. Mm-hmm. Um, the way that they chose to deal with the validation was... Uh, you know, collect samples over a certain period of time, I think maybe like three months or something like that, Uh, rotate the points of use sampling, you know, to get a fair distribution of of samples without, Mm -hmm. with, uh, sorry, throughout the water system. Um, And they, they looked at their CFUs and they looked at the, the measurements from the instrument and they felt confident enough that they uncovered a trend that sufficiently proved that the instrument was as good or better than what mm-hmm. they were seeing on the plate counts. Okay. Now, uh, that was on a, a roadie water system in yeah. that case. Yeah. Um, but the significance of the measurements was huge for them because they dropped uh, 70% of their plate counts. Right. So, yeah, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, um, again, as a former QC uh, microbiologist and, and investigator, if you can have a real-time measurement showing you that you have bacteria every second, um, as opposed to, you know, you're only getting snapshots from plate counts, and once you take that water sample and take it back to the lab, the biology and chemistry has already changed there, yeah, yeah. right? Whereas here, you're seeing continuous monitoring if you have a tool like this on your water system and you're proving that your water is consistently under control, you can fine tune your environmental monitoring program such that you don't have someone doing you know, routine sampling all day, every day, yep. because that's only one facet of what a QC micro person does. Yeah. They have so many more things that they need to do. Yeah, so. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a busy, it's a busy world. 70% though, that's a lot of, that's a big, chunk down. That would be pretty awesome. It would be. Well, think of how much, to your point, think of how much sampling they were doing and it really wasn't helping them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I remember I it's, heard And that. it's zero. Most of them it's zero. Yeah, ones and zeros. So right? what does a zero mean? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, that's a great right. question, That Jesse. is a great <laughs> question because we know having this instrument monitoring customers' water systems, we not know that zero, zero yeah. is not... <laughs> Uh, it's not really zero. Let, yeah. let me yeah. tell you, yeah. this is uh, speaking the truth. The yeah. soothsayer here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I, that's actually something I've thought of because you, you do ride that one zero like mm-hmm. all the time for most of these systems, right? Yeah. And because of the the nature of the the measurement, right. it mm-hmm. really means nothing. And you could it, you could be right on the edge of a big thing, and you have no idea because it's just mm-hmm. zero, right? And there's no real trending. And so. we, have, we have worked with customers that have experienced that where they were getting zero CFUs all along in their plate counts yeah. and come to find out uh, after a very long time period, like 60 or 90 days of using the instrument, that they actually had a problem with the incoming water yeah. and not their water system. And that is something that they would only have seen in real time mm-hmm. and not based on zeros or ones. Yeah. And you can move this around and do it in different places, and right? Well, potentially. Um, I mean, not. I've seen it with the TOC, so I just assume. Well, you can. <laughs> well, you know, inside the instrument, which we'll, uh, you know, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about. Part of the technology that we use is we're using a laser. Yeah. So that laser is being focused on a very small 
section of flowing water. Yep. And so um, we try not to have customers move the instrument around because the, labor vi the laser vibrates and we want to be able to see the microbial cells. But we tell customers, and many of them do so, is they could take a sample from another part of the loop, bring it to the instrument, oh, right, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, have a, because the instrument switches very quickly um, from online to, to sampling mode, okay. so they certainly could do that. So uh, don't listen to me. <coughs> don't roll your. Don't do that. Well, you don't want to roll it. You're I not think wrong. that if you have a very controlled environment, we can help you with that, okay. where yeah. you can move the instrument safely. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But it has its most value on sitting right next to your TOC analyzer, mm -hmm. where it's just water. You, most people tee off of the same water loop yep. as their TOC. This instrument, water comes in, it runs to drain, just like your online TOC device, yep. and it just sits there on your water loop and it measures Got continuously. It. All right, awesome. Okay, so we're, we're, we're flying through all this stuff, and by flying, I mean we're taking our time. <laughs> all right, so, um, so if we could, I want to just talk to process optimization really quick. I've seen in some of your literature where you help customers. So we've talked a little bit, sampling, that's not, that's not necessarily the process I'm thinking of. I'm right. thinking more of the process of dealing with your water system. So you have sanitization cycles and you mm -hmm. have ons and offs and you know take it online take it offline mm -hmm. like how is this helping customers with that because it seems like it could well that's a really great question and i want to go back to one of tracy's comments where she was talking about a customer that sanitizes every day mm -hmm. we've had customers um talk to us about yeah how often do you do your sanitization every day um every single day Yes, every day. That's our SOP. Okay, well, what if you didn't have to sample if you sanitize every day? When you're doing plate counts because you're doing intermittent grab sampling, um, you don't really know. You don't have enough information to make mm -hmm. that decision. So if you could sanitize, could you sanitize every other day? Could you sanitize every third day? Could you sanitize once a week? By monitor, being able to now monitor our water systems continually for microbial presence, mm -hmm. you now can have that information because I mentioned earlier that water system events ca do cause changes to the autofluorescent unit profile. Yep. So we're looking at microbial cells. Customers are normally looking for, do those microbial cells form a colony? We want to see the cells because that gives us a real-time picture. And so now by running the instrument during sanitization or during rinse cycles or um, after a maintenance, um, we, uh, water systems can be brought up very quickly after maintenance. Um, you can optimize sanitization cycles now because you have more information. You can see that during sanitization, if you're heat sanitizing, the AFU profile changes. And so, so, the, so, so I just so let me just ask to that then. So, mm -hmm. right now, a customer sanitizes for one hour, two hours, whatever. They have a time that they sanitize for, and you get to watch what happens during and after these sanitization yes, cycles. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And because of that, what you're getting at is like you can adjust. You, you can see it at different levels, and you can go. You're not really accomplishing anything here, or you didn't accomplish enough mm -hmm. with this. Like, so you can you can. Exactly stretch or, or compress as a result of that. Is that right? Maybe somebody's exactly. rinsing for six hours and they only have to rinse for two. So they've yeah. just gotten four hours of production back. And, and how they're much not throwing does, so much water away. And, yeah. You know, the director of manufacturing is going to be happy because, you know, that's money being made for them. Okay. And, and you know, another thing is, is that, uh, you know, in addition to the industries that are, are, are looking really heavily at um, online detection, because maybe they're bringing up a new plant, there's, they're a CDMO. There are still companies that have, I mean, microbial contamination is still an issue, especially mm -hmm. with non-sterile products. And mm -hmm. I, went to a, I went to a conference, I mean, an FDA um, representative was giving the conference, and, uh, and this really stuck with me because this gentleman said that, you know, whenever a company has microbial contamination, they don't really know where it's coming from, so they swap out everything and clean everything up. But it always comes back because we don't know where it is. And it can take mm -hmm. companies minimally six months mm -hmm. to figure out 
where the origin of the contamination was. And so by being able to now monitor continuously, it does give you more information and it does provide a better troubleshooting tool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we have seen instances where, and it's actually one of our case studies, where a customer had a water system, it was a uh, ambient Wi-Fi loop, and uh, they had a situation where they were monitoring, they had some historical trends from the instrument, which they were familiar with. Yeah. Well, the trends didn't kind of make sense, and they didn't know, okay, uh, we see we have a shift in our, in our baseline or in our average over a particular period of time. So they tried a maintenance step. Um, they thought that, well, maybe, you know, it's about time that we um, do maintenance on our, our RO membranes, and that didn't work. They tried something else. Um, they were able to bring the baseline or the, the average uh, down a little bit, but then they had a, um, a, a, an O-ring that was replaced on the water system during the maintenance, mm -hmm. um, and it was incorrectly seated. Now we're talking about not even, I think maybe it was two days. It was maybe a day and a half. They could see the trend start to creep huh. up yeah. because biofilm formed in under that, that gap. in that gap very yeah. quickly. They were dropping plate counts at the same time, and they never would have seen it. They never would have seen it. And they it. certainly so, wouldn't have been day one or two. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. So. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, really, that's really neat. And it's, it's just kind of fascinating to think about ultimate. I mean, we're just, we're just starting to see this, right? It's just getting a little bit of maturity in the industry, and people are using it in different ways and willing to accept what they're looking at in different ways, right? So we, ch we chatted about this real quick before we started recording, but... Um, I, I was curious about ozone versus heat. So ozone seems, there's a, I've heard it said, you know, ozone's been the next big thing for the last 30 years. Um, it just, it's never really taken off in the WIFI world, but with this ambient WIFI becoming more of a thing, ozone seems to be getting some legs. So this has an interesting view into the world of sanitization. So what are you seeing? What's the difference? What's the difference in ozone sanitization and a hot heat sanitization? That might not be the right question, but I think you know what I mean. I do, yeah, I do. Ozone is, is reportedly very efficient, much more efficient yep. and less costly than heat. But not everybody embraces it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, our European customers um, probably embrace it more, just maybe because of the real estate differences between. And then, um, you know, we in, in the U.S., we heat sanitize. Yep. So um, in the, <laughs> we have I, I have not seen only a, a few instances where we've, a customer has trended the um, autofluorescent unit trends between a purified water loop that's been ozone sanitized and one where it's been heat sanitized. And there was a market difference in mm. the AFU profile. Um, and on the ozone, ozone, ozonated system, it was lower. Okay, so your your trend lines, just one of them's higher than the other one, generally well, speaking. Well, the AFU, well, the, the trend was lower, but the AFU number. The number itself. The number itself okay. was an lower. Absolute. Okay. You know, and then so. when you do, say, you know, with, with, a, with a, most ozone systems, at least the tank is always being ozonated, right? Do you mm -hmm. think that makes a difference there? Do you think it's... It's just the nature of ozone, just always creating a lower baseline than the heat? Well, I think ozone is much more, you get more killing with ozone um, right. than with heat. Um, okay. And uh, you made a comment earlier about, uh, I thought you made a comment earlier when we were talking about ozone and killing. And, um, but it's just that I, I have always, I mean, we make ozone sensors, so we talk yep. to customers about you know ozone levels. It's just a very efficient way of sanitizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone I've spoken with that is uh, industry specialist agrees that ozone is just more efficient than heat. Mm -hmm. It's, it has a better killing power than, than heat, which is why a lot of you know, uh, customers that do embrace it are sold on it. Yeah, yeah. And it's very costly to heat up the water. Sure. I mean, yeah. there was a customer that I met with last year sometime that was talking about how they, uh, and they're, again, one of those people that they sanitize every day and, uh, you know, for like, I don't know, two to four hours. And they specifically told me that 
they only uh, heat up half a tank of water because of how much it costs to, to well, heat the water. Right. So, right. so that makes you wonder as well, um, you know, if they're only heating yeah. up that much water, you know, how efficient is the sanitization? But yeah. I mean, you have to look at the energy costs right now. That's a big deal. Yeah, and we're, we're seeing yeah, across absolutely. the industry, you know, in the water space, we're, we're, we're seeing more and more sort of corporate initiatives to go, how do we, you know, get a better lead score or whatever. Mm, like to, how do we bring How do we bring all this stuff down? We don't right. need to be using as much energy as we are. So what are the ways that we could do that? And certain places would be like, mm, I'm not giving up, you know, they, some places I will not give up heat sanitization. Nope, sorry, it's too, we have too much history reliability. But other places are going, hey, that's an easy win. We know this works. You know, it's an easy win, right? So, um, and again, something like this put online, and you can proof it and and uh, and show you know how how good it works. So that's that's pretty great. So we have covered a lot of different things. I want to make sure that we have a couple minutes here to just sort of show everybody how this thing works. So if we could, I I think Peggy Peggy's doing this, right? Yeah. All right. So Peggy's gonna give <laughs> us a little tour of the uh, seven thousand RMS. So, so this is the 7000 RMS, and think of this, um, for those of you who have um, online TOC devices, it's really the same concept, where you would place the, the instrument on your water loop, and many customers, when they start out with the 7000 RMS, they'll tee off of the same water loop as they, they have their TOC. So water comes into the instrument on this side of the unit, and it flows to drain. So it never, the water never goes back into the instrument. And then on the opposite side is where we land our power. So we, we have a power cord. We also have an ethernet connection. You can do analog outputs. You can send your data to a control system. Um, it is Modbus enabled. Um, and so at the very top that you can't really see, we cool the instrument with a fan, an external fan which is here. Um, there's an on-off switch here. And then the instrument, basically, water will come into the instrument and in a rate of 30 mils per minute. And uh, we, the instrument inside has a laser, a 405 uh, laser diode, um, where we illuminate the flowing water stream Sort of like with the TOC analyzer, water comes in, it goes through a quartz coil, and the instrument, you know, um, uses UV light, breaks down the organics. Well, with this instrument, we're shining a laser on the flowing water path. It has a very uh, small flow cell. And what we're looking for are two, two parameters. We're looking for, is there a particle? We detect particles using me scattering, which is the same concept as most particle detectors today. It just uses forward scattering of light to size that particle. We are going to count all the particles the instrument sees, but we don't. We we are not going to consider them relative to an autofluorescent unit. What we look when we look at the particles, we want one with within a certain size profile, mm -hmm. which is consistent with a microbial cell. And we also want to look for evidence of life. So we know that at 405 nanometers, that there are intracellular components, riboflavin and NADH, which are present in all living cells. We know that they will fluoresce intrinsically. So we look for, do we see a particle signal? Do we see fluorescence? At the same time, then we, that is a microbial cell, and the instrument will count an autofluorescent unit. And here on the main screen, we're going to trend those units. And here on the main screen, you can see that we're continuously monitoring. We have a display here that is ever changing because water's passing through the instrument and the instrument is detecting counts per second. So autofluorescent units per second on the main screen. We're also going to collect that information via data logging, where we're going to tell you how many autofluorescent units per volume. And the way customers mostly use that information is for their play counts, they have a certain volume, like mm -hmm. usually 10 ml or 100 ml. So they'll have a consistent volume for the online analyzer. So in this example, we have two autofluorescent units 
per 1 ml. And so, every time so that, that 1 ml change? change, yes, every time okay. the instrument, every time it gets to that volume, because we're doing counts per second here, we're at 30 mils per minute. So as soon as the instrument sees 1 ml or 100 mls, it will display the autofluorescent units that it saw. Mm -hmm. So if you like multiply this by what it sees, 100. So it's going to be 100 autofluorescent units or 200 autofluorescent units per 100 ml. And then the instrument is going to data log continuously that um, information. And, uh, and so what we analyze when we look for history on the instrument, there are two uh, USBs on the side of the instrument where we're landing the power. Um, and there are also um, archive folders on the hard drive of the instrument. And so we're always, the instrument's always data logging. Mm -hmm. And so um, we can look at real-time trends in the same way as you would see, um, and if you're sending analog outputs to your control system, we have customers that that really trend their autofluorescent units against their TOC and against their conductivity units, and it makes a nice correlation for them. Do, me, so, for them. so in a, in most facilities, um, it, so WIFI has to stay below 1.3 microsiemen, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty that's the number um, at 25C. So like if uh, in a lot of facilities, they'll set alarm limits sure. for that. They don't usually set their alarm at 1.3. They set it right. below because they want to know before it gets there right. or anything that's outside of the normal. So with this, are they doing something similar? Do they have some sort of baseline number that they go, oh, this is kind of how it runs. And if it's, you know, so if it's normally at like this is showing one, two, four, if that's normal, um, do they set a, a 15 or a 20 as an alarm level? How would they do that? Excuse me, that's a really great question. Um, I'm going to go into, so on the main screen we have a configuration menu, we have a sample menu, and we have a clean menu. So this just um, makes it very easy to get into the instruments. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to use, I can use my finger here, it's touch sensitive. We, sell, we send a keyboard with the instrument if you want to use that. But in, inside the instrument here, this is part of the configuration menu, and I'm actually in what we're calling the log tab. And in, in that location, you're going to tell the instrument, um, how do I want to log my data? And, and in this example that I'm displaying, I'm logging by 1 ml increments. Um, most of the time, we suggest the customer will log in 100 ml increments. So over time, then, um, that there will be a, a trend very, very quickly, actually. You can get some baseline trends. So we recommend that you, you set up, you figure out what your average is over a period of time. Mm -hmm. We normally say, why don't you do it for two weeks? Because the thought there is that usually in most water systems, you've gone through a process cycle. You've seen a sanitization. You perhaps have done a maintenance. And you can see how your autofluorescent units trend during that period of time. So once you have that average, then you use statistics to set limits. And so in, in the examples, when we talk to customers, let's just say um, in my water system, I'm getting 150 AFUs per 100 ml over my time period, whatever I set. It's up to the customer. Mm -hmm. So then you would use standard deviations above the baseline and use perhaps two standard deviations on top of the baseline to set your alert limit. And then there would be a, um, an action limit, and maybe you do three standard deviations on added to your baseline and set your action limit. And then uh, your auto specification limit, maybe it's five. Mm -hmm. So you just use statistics to be able to set some limits based on those trends. And we're doing that now with Many customers are doing it um, with their total organic carbon measurements, mm -hmm. right? So we know that 500 ppb is bad. You can't use your water. But most water systems today, and you know this, mm -hmm. are making water much better. Way lower than Way, way yeah. lower than 500 ppb. So it, in, in many cases, it makes no sense to set your limit up that high when you're making water at 20, 20 ppb of TOC. Right. So how do you do that? You do that using your um, historical data, and then you set alert limits based on statistics. Yep. So it's, it's the same situation. 
and you can always change it. Tracy mentioned that we have one customer and we've worked with them a lot where they have um, a heavy seasonal influence because they're using lake water. Yep. Um, and this is a, they're, they're making, um, you know, um, um, personal wipes and things like that. So they, they change their alert limits during the off season or, or the on season, however you want to look at it. Mm -hmm. But they have trended their data long enough where they see the seasonal change. And so their alert limits in the summer, they're gonna change them. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna be different in the winter, in winter. But they know that now because they've trended data over a period of time. Okay. So that's how that works. Excellent. And so the instrument also has, we talked about the alarm tab, the log tab. Um, the support tab is, uh, is very interesting here is where you can see actually the instrument trends a lot of information. It will trend your pump flow rate, your temperature of your pump, your humidity. Um, it will um, trend, it will give you alert limits. Now everything's green on, the, on the, all of these little icons that we have in the instrument. They actually are all green. But if there's an error, you'll get a very visible in the sea of green, our little red mm. um, light that comes on. And so you now can look at that and go, okay, so do I need to call Mettler Toledo or gee, maybe my flow stopped to my instrument and the instrument said, hey, I don't have any flow, so I'm going to shut down for a minute. Um, it also, in this section, allows you to get into some administrative functions. So here is where I might set my password protection. Like maybe I don't want everyone to be an administrator. Like you might want to be an administrator and go in and tweak everything, mm -hmm. but maybe, you know, somebody who's not as well trained, you don't want them going in and messing with the instrument with the limits that you've set up in the instrument. So that's the screen that you would do that. Um, we have three levels of protection on the instrument. So uh, you can set your password. You can set limits on when you want to change your password. So like 21 what CFR. Is yes, it, it's it? not. It's 21 CFR compatible. Yep. Yeah because we don't store electronic right. data. You don't, yeah. um, but that with, could be uh, sent to Yes, another to a system. control system. Right. And most of the time, customers are using this instrument, sending analog outputs or outputs via Modbus. Yep. Um, and and that's how they're doing it. Or right. they, yeah. And I think that, I think that we internally we're here working on the whole, if, if customers want to store data, data locally, we've just not seen that as an issue mm -hmm. at this point in time. Okay. Um, and then there's, um, there's, if I go back to the support page, so your SCADA functionality is where you would enable your Modbus. This is also where if you were sending analog outputs to your control system, this is where you would scale them. Okay. This also is a place where you can look at your software version. It gives you your serial number of the instrument. So um, should we need to troubleshoot it and we ask you, gee, what software version do you have on the instrument? Um, the instrument is um, set up with auto start. So if water or pressure drops to on the inlet side of the instrument, you can set some time where you can, uh, the instrument can be told to auto start. Don't start until 15 minutes or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So okay. there's some nice features on the instrument to just make it user friendly. All of the screens have an online keyboard. And so you can use your external keyboard um, or um, you can also use your, <laughs> thank you, Jesse. <laughs> also, you can use your, um, your keyboard here. And it has a very small X. And I actually this is why you have a really hard time. <laughs> I have a really hard time with this. Why don't you see if you can oh, do it? Do you it? think my fat fingers are going to be able to do Sometimes, this thing? Sometimes. It could just be you. See? Oh, I have very accurate see? fat fingers. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. So, um, so back to the main screen. Uh, so you kind of get an idea. Yeah. And, and this can be, and we talked about this earlier, but this can be used online, which would be the typical. Yes. But it also has an offline mode where you could, if we were trying to figure out what was going on, you could sample water from other places and bring it over to the side. You which could. I don't know if you could see it in here, but it'll be over here somewhere. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you, so you would just change here. You hit on the screen and say, okay, 
Oh, do I want to change to a so two way grab sample? I'm not going to do grab. Oh, I could because it's. Let's uh, see what happens. Yeah, so it just um, gives you a place where you can identify your sample. You can tell the instrument, well, how much of a sample do I have here? Using your keyboard. Yes. <laughs> or um, my fingers work pretty well here. It just I have trouble with the X. So the instrument is always going to ask for a prime volume because it's 30 mils per minute. So we have to prime the loop. Yep. So, But the instrument tells you, okay, if I have my sample, it's 50 um, ml, then this is how much I need in okay. the bottle, okay. in the grab sample bottle. And then you just put push start, push continue, and it will just um. measure that entire contents, whatever you put in there. You can display incrementally. Let's just say I can't wait for 50 mLs to display. Mm -hmm. I want to see what, what it's reading in 10 mL increments or 20 mL increments. You can put that in there. Okay, all right. And then you can do a clean function on the instrument. We clean it with 6% hydrogen peroxide mm -hmm. or 1% paracetic acid. It cleans up very quickly. Um, it's very efficient. It's really very user-friendly. Great. Is there anything else in here that we need to see? Um, I don't exit sample mode. So it tells you. Uh, also, what's also nice is some customers will ask us, you know what, if you get bubbles, how does the instrument handle that? Ah, the bubbles. And so <laughs> we actually have a bubble detector here. Oh, So like the it. laser is off right now because this is not once the laser comes back on. Um, it turns bright blue, and then we start measuring. So this is 100% bubble right now. Yes, yeah. it's 100% <laughs> bubble. Um, and they, so what else did I want to show? So it has a logging on function. So here Based you have to user, put in your yeah. user ID and your password. Okay. Or if you want to create a new password, you can, and you just hit log on. Um, and then once water resumes to the instrument, the instrument will automatically start measuring. There is a four port switching valve on the side of the instrument. So the instrument switches very quickly from online to grab sample mode within a matter of uh, seconds. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to use. It's just a really short tube. Yeah, yes. that's awesome. So actually great. I have the tube here and we just so have, we, we provide, uh, so you so probably close. can't see it, so <laughs> we provide little stainless steel um, Where's our cameraman I know, <laughs> he's left for the day. Oh <laughs> man, Alex, we're throwing you under the bus. Well, thank you so much for that tour of uh, the 7000 RMS. This was great. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I, I don't touch this stuff when I go to a customer <laughs> site. It's, it's a rule of mine as a sales guy. Don't touch the machines. <laughs> I let them do it for me, and they walk me through it, so I appreciate that. But thank you so much for being on. I learned a ton, um, and I'm, I'm excited to see more of these things out in the field as I visit customers around the world. So if somebody wanted to learn more about this, beyond the podcast or maybe some other you know, video on YouTube, how would they get a hold of you guys? What's the best way? Well, I would say um, certainly mt.com is a great... It's an easy website, it's a, mt.com, it's a very, I like Yeah, it. and so you can uh, get literature um, through the website. There's also a lot of information on the website on the product on the product mm -hmm. page, so that's a simple way, okay. and you don't have to bother with a salesperson, but if you really <laughs> I know want to talk with a nice. salesperson, <laughs> then um, certainly Tracy is available, <laughs> um, and also your local Bell or Toledo representative for the Process Analytics Group, either your Ingold representative or Thornton, um, are very familiar with the instrument, and if they need support, I'm available, Tracy of course is available, if you want to see an instrument demonstration, um, we typically do those virtually, so that's a possibility. But uh, and then also um, we have a really wide technical support group. We uh, because it's an instrument, in, uh, different measurement. It's not play counts, and customers aren't used to online trends for microbial. Then um, we really are, are available to help you with data analysis, and uh, it's kind of a shared discussion because we don't, we may not know your process, may not know your water system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, any other comments that I missed, Tracy? 
Just that we have a team of diverse individuals that are ready and able to support you if, if you need Excellent. it. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, and you guys are water experts, so I know people can come to you guys for lots of different questions even beyond this. Yeah. So. And a lot of, I, I'll be honest, a lot of what I've shared today comes from my customers mm -hmm. because my customers literally teach me everything. Yeah. So. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on today. I appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you guys. Thanks, Jesse. Maybe at the Boston Product Show. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. All right. This was great. See ya.